Right, so Israel demanded the northern half of the Gaza Strip be evacuated within a time span of 24 hours. That amounts to some 1.1 million people having to move in that time space. And even the United Nations have called this out as being utterly impossible. You cannot evacuate that many people that quickly. Some will be disabled, some will be elderly, some will be in hospital, and they'll have to be moved. Though with the electricity cut off, hospitals won't be able to function anyway. How will diabetes sufferers keep their insulin cold without refrigeration? And this is all without, besides the fact that there's no fuel available in the north to help people move, and the roads are covered in rubble. But again, what incentive is there to put the power back on when politicians around the world keep going on TV and saying Israel has the right to do all of this in the name of defending itself? There's also the question of where are all these people meant to go once in the south and not being a doom monger, not wishing to be or anything like that. But when you're talking about Gaza already being one of the most densely populated places on Earth and you double that level of overcrowding and when you also consider Gaza is basically the planet's largest open air prison and these people have nowhere else to go but to become even more concentrated in one area you can't help but begin to fear the worst right so 1.1 million people have been told to evacuate gaza city in the north of the gaza strip and you've got 24 hours to do that so say the israeli occupiers presumably before they level that half of the gaza strip in the name of bombing out hamas having told their human shields to flee to the equally overcrowded south of the strip making it twice as overcrowded as it was before. It's interesting that they always have to go at Hamas for using human shields, isn't it? The fact the Israeli Defence Force headquarters in Tel Aviv sit in the middle of a residential district is just pure coincidence, I suppose. Anyway, Gazans have been given their marching orders, and indeed they have left by any means possible, by car if they've got fuel, on foot, by donkey, I've read some reports say. But to move that many people in that shorter space of time is impossible. Of course, that predicates upon Israeli forces actually caring if these people get out in time or not. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres made the point clear in a speech the other day because it isn't as if Israel has stopped bombarding the area whilst this directive has been given out. So not only is the time frame obscenely short and unmeetable, but it's having to be done whilst Israel is still literally attacking them. It gets even worse than that though, as it would appear Israel is still targeting people even after following the order to leave. Some 70 people have been killed and 200 injured whilst trying to get out of Gaza City by Israeli airstrikes, deliberately targeting of civilians following their instruction to leave. They were doing what they were told to do for their own apparent safety and they still got attacked. I thought Hamas had hostages. That's another line that we're coming out with, isn't there? How could you be sure there would be no hostages there? I can only assume the excuse for this airstrike is that you will have believed Hamas were present there. But surely that would predicate you not airstriking them because you might bomb your own hostages. What gives there? But that aside, if these were just ordinary Palestinians, as I'm sure they were, as the whole world thinks they, they were just fleeing, but what awaits them should they make it to the south, though? Facilities are even worse in the south of the Strip. The electricity, the water and the food are already stopped. And when Israel told people to go to Egypt, if they could, they then went and bombed the Rafah border crossing, preventing Palestinians from leaving South Gaza anyway to get into Egypt. So they're now being herded up like sheep into a smaller enclosure, being attacked and killed as they flee to get there. And their only exit, only available by the leave of Egypt anyway, has been cut off too because they bombed it. I'm not the first or only person fearing the worst here by these actions, fearing what could be another Nakba in the making. Jeremy Corbyn has issued a statement on the matter, and this was pretty stark too. He wrote, We may be witnessing the beginning of the total annihilation of Gaza and its people. This is not a battle between one state and another. It is couched as an Israeli response to a non-state actor. But in fact, it is a response to Palestinian people wherever they are. What is unfolding is not a conflict of equals, but the systematic starvation, subjugation and destruction of an unarmed civilian population. I wonder, if Gaza is wiped off the face of the earth, whether our politicians will look back and reflect on the reality of their unwavering support. If they had any integrity, they would mourn the innocent Palestinian lives that have been erased in the name of self-defence. They should be ashamed of their cowardice, knowing that others will pay the price for the war crimes they refuse to oppose. Of course he's absolutely right. That is absolutely damning. And it really does make your blood boil. There's a reason he always tends to hold up on the right side of history, isn't there? But sadly, I think this is exactly where the situation is heading. Evacuate the north of the Gaza Strip, or 
give the impression of that, aided and abetted by fawning politicians and media, whether those people get out in time, whether hospitals can get patients out, whether everyone has sufficient way and means to leave, they don't care. When time is up, they'll bomb the hell out of it. Level Gaza City and surrounding areas, and no doubt that'll become more real estate for Israel to seize. Who believes otherwise? It's what they've done for decades. A population would then be crammed into a piece of land, half of what it used to be, which was already overcrowded, and with no way out thanks to being bombed and shot at as they left the north, and thanks to the only exit via Egypt being bombed out too. They are trapped, and with everything we are learning and we are seeing via social media, via alternative news, because of course mainstream sources are not covering what's important here, the violence and atrocity we're seeing that is getting excused... Who would put it past someone like Netanyahu and his coalition with the far right to not finish the job many of them believe David Ben-Gurion, the first Israeli Prime Minister, failed to do? Many Zionists truly and honestly believe that the Palestinian people should have been annihilated, and still should be, and with seemingly every country going around excusing everything Israel are doing, even in this day and age, can you honestly see Israel not at least thinking about how they might be able to get away with that? Well, honestly, they wouldn't. They might with our politicians, they might... On the media, it might be a bridge too far for some of those. But look at the size of the demonstrations we've witnessed this weekend. Look at the attitudes and numbers of informed people. And you can imagine Israel getting called out for committing such an atrocity. 2.3 million people. Not that, that what they've been doing already isn't appalling. 600 Palestinian kids dead in six days. Of course, 40% of the population of the Gaza Strip is under 14 years of age. Or are they going to tell us all of these kids are in Hamas too? But can you imagine Israel getting called out for their atrocity and attempting to play the anti-Semite card again, as they always do when they come under criticism? They're playing it now, even as we defend Palestine. So should that not say something for all the weaselly excuses made to come down on people for anti-Semitism up till now? Who was the one politician who turned out at that London pro-Palestine demo yesterday? Yep, the same one I mentioned a moment ago. Jeremy Corbyn giving a belting speech to a crowd estimated to be some 100,000 people strong. But he was the anti-Semite, wasn't he? I hesitate to say that this is where I think Israel is going, that this is the end game. I truly do not want to countenance such mass murder happening in my lifetime. Something on that scale, I thought, surely has to be consigned to the history books and that we've learned from those events so that it can't happen again. But when you see every government across the world offering support, offering troops, offering aid to the oppressors, to this oppressive regime, you genuinely wonder who is in charge in some of those governments, and given they are all seemingly enthralled to Israel, even as they act as they are doing now. This isn't chasing down Hamas, this is pinning down the entire population of Gaza, and it no longer seems beyond the realms of possibility that Gaza could be annihilated and done with, what, with what basically amounts to global consent. In the name of eliminating Hamas, a group that only came into existence because of Israeli treatment of Palestinians to start with, if this comes to pass, if our governments support this, then we have a serious issue with who we have in power and who we have leading us, because they aren't fit to. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please do like, share and subscribe if you did. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where the media support for Israel has even extended to making up false stories to attack Hamas further. You don't really need to do that, surely. But it's all part of that agenda of ensuring more people see this as a black and white issue. That Israel are the good guys. Well, actually, for as long as Israel has existed, so far as Palestinians are concerned, they've been anything but. And I'll hope to catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer appears to be discovering that his ardent support for Israel might not be going entirely his way, as people are more switched on to matters than he previously thought, and no amount of dictatorial bans on showing support with Palestine or apparent threats of expulsion from the Labour Party have made the slightest bit of difference, judging by the size of the pro-Palestine demonstrations we have seen happening this weekend. So in true coward's fashion, he's now backpedalling, with an appalling statement on the Palestine-Israel situation that is fooling nobody. It's too little, far too late, and if anything has hardened more people against him and his hypocrisy. As always, Keir Starmer is on the wrong side of the argument and the wrong side of history, and people are, in no uncertain terms, telling him so. Right, so Keir Starmer's quizzling statement. Let's start with that. What wisdom has the brill-creamed one deigned to share with us in the name of still siding unequivocally with Israel whilst trying to pretend he suddenly gives a shit about Palestinians, given he gave the nod to Israel the other day to literally commit war crimes in shutting off water and electricity? Here's what he said. I won't do the voice today, but he said... 
A week ago, we awoke to the unimaginable and heartbreaking news of terrorist attacks on Israel from Gaza by Hamas. In the days that have followed, we have heard horrific stories of the murder and mutilation of men, women and children, along with the horror of hostage taking. Israel has the right, indeed the duty, to defend herself and rescue these hostages. Responsibility for what has happened sits with the terrorists of Hamas, and we repeat our calls for Hamas to release all hostages. I've met with members of the British Jewish community this week and told them that we stand with Israel and with them at this time. I know this is a distressing and a worrying time and welcome the extra funding for the CST. There must be zero tolerance of any increase in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Hamas has no interest in peace, no interest in protecting Palestinians. We call on all parties to act in line with international law, including allowing humanitarian access of food, water, electricity and medicines to Gaza and ensure safe humanitarian corridors in Gaza for those fleeing violence. Seven days on from the darkest day in Israel's recent history, our resolve in the face of terrorism must not falter. Makes you feel a little bit sick, doesn't it? This man was saying just the other day that Israel had the right to withdraw food, water and electricity from Palestinians. There's no way doing so specifically targets Hamas. And now he's basically acknowledged that he completely screwed up in that LBC interview where he said that and needs to backpedal a bit. That's as far as the backpedalling unfortunately went though, because his support for Israel in this is as ardent as ever. Zionist without qualification. His words, and he will always be tarnished with them. It doesn't matter that Palestine has been suffering terrorist attacks, suffering from occupation, has been the victims of the Nakba of war in 1948 and in 1967, which saw their land stolen. It doesn't matter that Israel conducts itself as an apartheid state because Starmer still has and always will have their backs. Even the one specific reference in his statement to Palestinians saw him unable to bring himself to say that actual word. He said, ensure safe humanitarian corridors in Gaza for those fleeing violence. Those being Palestinians on the receiving end of violence from Israel, of course. Why can't you just say that, Keith? Ah, but if you said Palestine specifically, then you might accidentally differentiate Palestinians from Hamas. And that might burst the bubble over how much right Israel has to be doing what they are doing. He also again brought up one of my pet hates, addressing the Jewish community, singular, as there is more than one. And what you really mean is the Zionist community, because in case you've missed the large amount of protest footage happening here in the UK, conducted by people you want to govern over, a hell of a lot of them were Jewish. And they were calling out Israel, not Palestine. They are not people in agreement with you. They are not Zionists. And I would bet my bottom dollar you didn't speak to any of them. Your Jewish community is a very small section of the large number of Jewish communities, plural, in this country. Also, it can't be missed the bits where he said, I've met with members of the British Jewish community this week and told them that we stand with Israel and with them at this time, thus conflating Judaism, the Jewish community, as he puts it, with the state of Israel, which is the last time I looked an anti-Semitic thing to do. Far be it from me to rant over every line of this though, although I could, because some responses to this statement on social media are just as damning. Columnist and former Corbyn Director of Policy Andrew Fisher said, the utter lack of humanity for Palestinians is despicable. The boilerplate language about international law as if it's some sort of effing hypothetical rather than actual war crimes being committed right now is disgusting. This man is not fit for public office. Expulsion letter in the post, possibly Andrew, but absolutely every word of it true. Mikey Walsh, a political activist, particularly for the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller community. So a man who knows a thing about discrimination, he came out and said, You encouraged war crimes being committed right before our eyes. Hospitals beyond capacity being bombed, thousands of Palestinians and their babies being killed, and those ordered to flee are murdered as they try. Not a word of regret or Israeli condemnation from human rights lawyer. Again, bang on the money. Barrister Jane Haybrook, someone also familiar with human rights law, incidentally, likely a damn sight more than Keir Starmer is anyway, said, You charlatan. You knew full well what Netanyahu's fascist government response would be. You could have called it out before the illegal ethnic cleansing happened instead of waiting till the 11th hour and wringing your blood-soaked hands. You supported this. You can't backpedal now. Stats for lefties, the left-leaning pollster account, waded in as well, saying thousands of Palestinians killed, hundreds of children dead, hospitals bombed, civilian convoys massacred, war crime after war crime, ethnic cleansing, and this is what he offers, not one word of criticism towards Israel. Not one word. Starmer is a disgrace. Even Momentum, a literal Labour affiliate group, have condemned Starmer publicly with their comments, saying, 
Israel's demand for millions to leave northern Gaza has been termed a death sentence and ethnic cleansing. It still engages in collective punishment of Palestinians. Israel has used white phosphorus and killed thousands in indiscriminate bombing. Starmer ignores it all. Shame. The last comment I'll draw attention to and make mention of comes from the Just Jews account, an account providing alternative Jewish opinion in light of the Labour Party and anti-Semitism, who have said, what is the point of calling on an apartheid occupied colonial power to act in line with international law, of which it has been in grave violation for decades, with zero consequences? This isn't just cowardice, it's complicity in genocide. Well, exactly. What will it take to bring Israel to heel, especially with leaders like Starmer? It starts by treating them exactly the same as we treated South Africa in the 80s with boycott, divestment and sanctions. Sadly, it appears we'll have to put the screws on our own politicians really tightly this right time around, though, because for some reason with Israel, they think it's entirely different. Literally hundreds of comments on this now, 99.9% .9 condemning Starmer for continuing to be an absolute coward and backing the oppressor time after time. And I firmly believe that will not change either. It should also be noted that this statement of Starmer's came out mere hours after a diktat was sent out to all Labour members, councillors and MPs, forbidding them all from attending a pro-Palestine rally that might have been happening near them. None of them are pro-Hamas rallies, not one of them. So if anything, this demand, courtesy of Starmer's sidekick and General Secretary David Evans, says even more than Starmer's pathetic letter does. Because for all of his weakest piss backpedal towards the human rights of Palestinians, caught up in the crossfire right now, he really didn't mean a single word of it, when showing solidarity with those same people has been made a disciplinary offence where you could be suspended and presumably expelled. To be a Labour member now, to obey such authoritarianism, is to be complicit in this, and it's of no surprise to me that I'm saying, seeing post after post on social media of members cutting their membership cards up and resigning once again. Another wave of them. To be part of the Starmer regime tends to be complicit in wringing your hands and standing on the sidelines as war crimes are being committed, as we might be witnessing the beginning of another Nakba for all we know. Palestinians now so concentrated and crammed in in the south of Gaza, as overcrowded as it is, there are now so many people in houses, now reports are saying they're having to sleep standing up. They're literally packed into houses like sardines. No room to breathe even. Where will they go if they're attacked again? How much more land can you take from people? And what then, Keir Starmer, will you defend Israel again as Gaza gets more bits of it chipped away, gets blown away? We cannot afford to have this man as our leader, ever. He is so toxic. He is so dangerous. He needs ousting from politics completely, not promoting to the top job in the land. God help all of us if that happens. But God help anyone speaking out against Israel or speaking up for Palestine. Suella Braverman might have threatened to lock people up for waving a Palestinian flag. This idiot would almost certainly do it. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content up daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where I covered Starmer's literal support for those Israeli war crimes before he backpedaled. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so a Tory MP is preparing to take his own Tory government to court over their stance on the ongoing Palestine-Israel crisis on the basis that their advocacy for one side and one side alone, and that side being the oppressor, the decades-long aggressor of the state of Israel, actually makes them complicit in the ongoing war crimes being committed because they can be seen to be egging them on by backing them unequivocally, whatever they do. Backbench Tory MP Crispin Blunt just happens to also be the director of the ICJP, the International Centre for Justice for Palestinians, and they've issued a threat of legal action on the government and any other politicians for whom evidence can be linked to aiding and abetting war crimes. So Keir Starmer might be in a spot of bother too. Right, so one of the bigger news stories that has come out here in the UK in connection with the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict has been the response to British political language and discourse by ICJP director and Tory MP Crispin Blunt, a guy who actually supports Rishi Sunak politically. He quite likes his boss, his leader. So you, you do wonder how many Tory MPs still actually admit to that right now, actually. But he's extremely concerned that Sunak and co really don't have a scooby about the ramifications of their ardent pro-Israel stances. Blunt has been interviewed a lot by the mainstream media this week. This Part of the conflict has gained some traction with them, unusually, given Blunt is a pro-Palestine campaigner. 
But he's also familiar with the relevant law here, more so than Burks like Keir Starmer certainly seem to be. And given his background is in the military, not the legal profession, that should be all the more embarrassing for Keith. Though I wonder if that same military background happened to shape his position regarding Palestine and Israel, that he sees it for what it is based on his own experience from where he comes from and not through the coffers of the Israel lobby, as seems to be the case so often elsewhere. At any rate, in one interview, Blunder said, the United Kingdom government has given unequivocal support to the state of Israel. Statements repeated by the Prime Minister yesterday, and I'm uncertain that they fully understand the implications of the developments of international law, whereby if you are encouraging a party to undertake a war crime, you become complicit in that crime itself. It's absolutely clear now that what is happening in Gaza does amount to a war crime, because it is disproportionate and does not distinguish the targets it is taking out. Hence the terrible number of children that have been killed and what we've heard from the World Health Organization and their concerns about the effects of the transfers on the hospitals. A forced transfer of 1.2 million people is an absolute crime under the laws of war. You are simply not allowed to do it, as indeed is the collective punishment of the people of Gaza with a siege and an imposition of no food, no water and no electricity. God, it's a horrible feeling to be in agreement with a Tory. I don't like it. But Blunt isn't wearing his politician's hat here, but a more humanitarian one. He drew attention to the number of children who have died. The population of Gaza, absurdly young as it mostly is, 40% of the population there are under 14. And 764 kids have been killed by Israel's indiscriminate attacks on, Hamas, on Gaza in the last seven days. And they aren't Hamas. They're collateral damage. Collateral that Israel, in their conduct, does not give a shit about. Lending more weight to the case that those supporting the Israeli state come what may, could end up being found guilty of being complicit in war crimes too. Fundamentally, the language coming from our government and too many other MPs risks them being declared complicit in war crimes. Perhaps seeing what Tony Blair has gotten away with, they figure they're safe, but I wouldn't bet on it this time around. Rishi Sunak, just the other day, a week after the incursion by Hamas into, e into Israel that Egypt had warned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was about to happen, and were apparently ignored, Sunak said, we stand with Israel, not just today, not just tomorrow, but always. And I stand with you, the British Jewish community, not just today, not just tomorrow, but always. Am Israel Chai. No words can begin to describe the horror and barbarism unleashed in Israel a week ago. Daughters, sons, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, grandparents, taken from people in the cruelest and most horrific way possible. Hundreds of people have been killed, many wounded or missing, and others living through the unimaginable agony of having a loved one kidnapped and held hostage. British citizens were amongst the victims, and as we continue to learn more, I know there are families here and in Israel in deep pain and torment. My thoughts and my heart go out to everyone suffering in the wake of these attacks. No mention of Palestine once, you'll notice, and just like Keir Starmer, he addresses this nebulous, non-existent Jewish community, when there are many separate communities, and many of them, most of them I dare say, are condemning Israel and their occupation and their decades of violence. We stand with Israel always, he says. Well, this proves Crispin Blunt's point. If Israel are guaranteed your support, whatever they do, then what influence are you on forcing them to change tack and take a more humanitarian approach and act within international law, which they blatantly have not done? Sunak isn't alone in facing potential prosecution, though. Keir Starmer said Israel has the right to withhold water and food from Gaza, which is a war crime. As a human rights barrister, it was an appalling and stupid comment from a man who should know better. Now, he backpedaled, as I went over in another video, but has not apologised for those comments, nor has he actually withdrawn them, presumably too arrogant to do so. James Cleverly, Sunday morning, got the Victoria Derbyshire treatment. Two weeks running. No Laura Coonsberg. Politicians actually getting pushed. I could get used to that. But he was presented with multiple slides of people saying Israel has broken international law and ignored them completely, saying there's a lot of quotes you aren't showing which don't agree with them. Completely missing the point. Derbyshire pushed him by asking him, will you support Israel whether it breaks international law or not? And Cleverly gave a response saying we are committed to international law. To which Derbyshire responded by asking, have you asked Israel to wait until civilians have moved out of northern Gaza? To which Cleverly said no. So in other words, you don't actually give a damn about the Palestinians either. Complicit. David Lamy said much the same on the same show. No surprise, really, after his warm greeting in passing with Cleverly backstage. An image proving beyond doubt that there is absolutely nothing between the two main parties in this country anymore. 
and certainly not on this Palestine-Israel issue. Lamy's getting a video of his own for his performance, that's coming next. But functionally, we're seeing politicians on both sides backing Israel, it seems, without question. And so Crispin Blunt and the ICJP have issued a notice of intention to prosecute over this matter. In a letter written to Rishi Sunak, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly and the Attorney General Victoria Prentice, the ICJP have issued a notice of intention to prosecute UK officials complicit in war crimes and a notice of risk of imminent commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity by Israel in Gaza. And it reads... We put the UK government on notice that we intend to bring legal proceedings against politicians in the UK and elsewhere where there is evidence that they have aided, abetted or in any other way supported, encouraged or provided material assistance in the commission of a war crime. In order to prevent legal action, the UK government must immediately 1. Issue a public statement condemning Israeli breaches of international law. 2. Ask each government official that has encouraged war crimes in Gaza to rescind their statements in public. Three, insist Israel complies unequivocally with international law. Four, immediately act to safeguard civilians in Gaza. Five, call for an immediate ceasefire to prevent further loss of life. And six, call for an immediate end to the siege to allow them to secure access of medical aid to Gaza. We have passed a copy of this letter to Scotland Yard's War Crimes Unit, who have recently requested information and evidence in relation to terrorism and war crimes in the region. We will continue to assist them with gathering evidence in relation to the contents of this letter. We reserve our rights to proceed to apply for a private arrest warrant for politicians complicit in war crimes without further notice. Signed Crispin Blunt MP and Tayab Ali, ICJP directors. Will they follow through? Will we see politicians publicly rescinding comments? Will we see them facing arrest warrants? All eyes will very much be on Sunak and Starmer in this regard, but of course others as well. Sunak is to give a speech later today. He hasn't done so at time of writing, so perhaps he will rescind then. Or perhaps he'll double down instead and effectively call out the ICJP's bluff. What our political leaders say on this matters. They have to be held accountable if they choose to be irresponsible in what they say. The ICJP might well be prepared to do so, but we shall see. As I was writing this, a similar letter from the ICJP has now been addressed directly to Keir Starmer. So opposition politicians, not least himself, are now very much on the ICJP radar, confirmed as they should be. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation. Where Star is backpedalling, didn't quite cut it, doesn't go far enough, but isn't fooling anyone. He really does need to rescind. All eyes will be on him too. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so David Lammy, Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, he's had an absolute mare of an interview with Victoria Derbyshire on Sunday morning, where whilst being questioned on the Palestine-Israel situation and the question of whether or not he supports the order to move the 1.1 million people being forced to move south by Israeli forces, he refused to answer. And the basis for his fudging of the question was probably the most careerist nonsense I've ever heard a politician come out with, because his reason to not answer was, it would appear, that he felt it would harm his chances of becoming Foreign Secretary if Labour formed the next government. Right, so David Lammy, Shadow Foreign Secretary and a man who apparently is prepared to put his career ahead of doing the right thing in a humanitarian crisis. The most important issue to Lammy, not being a concern for war crimes or the deaths of civilians, notably kids, 764 of them killed by Israel in Gaza in the last seven days, but no. These issues apparently pale into insignificance compared to Lamy's lofty career ambitions. Victoria Derbyshire asking him a very simple question in relation to the order from Israel for Gaza civilians in the north to move south. She asked him, do you support the order to move them or not? Just yes or no? You'd think from Lamy's reaction she'd asked him to drink bleach. He came back with, it's not a yes or no, Victoria. I'm hoping one day to be foreign secretary and a chief diplomat. So it's not a yes or no. This is a war situation. War is ugly. Very, very sadly, people die. We have rules, and those rules mean that you must minimise death. Now you know, and I know, because Netanyahu has said, that there will be an invasion shortly. Against that backdrop, of course it's right the civilians must not be in harm's way. An order has been issued. I'm glad that order has been extended. But the point I want to get across is that it's hugely important that we minimise the loss of human life. God help us if this asshole ever does become foreign secretary with an attitude like that. Because the answer is yes. 
get the people out of harm's way. If Lamy wanted to caveat that, then saying give sufficient time until all civilians are out would be a fair and meaningful thing to say. It would certainly minimise deaths, hopefully not just minimise them, but eliminate them completely. 1.1 million people to move. So far, Hamas have stated 400,000 have moved. More time they certainly need. But the answer, quite obviously, can't be no to Darvish's question, Dave, because that would mean you didn't care who lived or who died. You could further caveat it by having a swipe at Israel for saying the enforced movement of the people of North Gaza out of their homes and moving them south is a war crime itself because you simply are not allowed to make such demands. But not Dave! No! Dave fears he might not keep the Shadow Foreign Secretary gig if he calls Israel out on anything. Job first, preventing war second, it appears. Why not demand a ceasefire as the International Centre of Justice for Palestinians, the ICJP, are demanding? Shouldn't that be your job as Foreign Secretary? Or is Israel the exception? Lamy is, of course, a member of Labour Friends of Israel and has enjoyed substantial donations from the Israel lobby. I believe Keir Starmer's chief leadership backer, Trevor Chin, of the Jewish Leadership Council, has apparently given Lamy somewhere in the region of £30,000 in donations. So, is it the job of the money, Dave? Can't be the money, surely. You're raking it in with your LBC show as well, aren't you, Dave? Highest second job earning MP in the Labour Party, aren't you, Dave? Does anything drive you apart from what's in it for you, Dave? War is ugly, he said. People die, he said, in the most emotionless way he possibly could, throwing it at Derbyshire as if she doesn't grasp the concept. But it came across to the viewer as simply not caring at all. Call for the ceasefire. Stop the bloodshed completely while civilians move. But no, Dave was all about minimising it rather than preventing it. Very much an, oh, well, I asked nicely. They didn't listen. Nothing I could do. Attitude. Sorry. Can't do more than this. I've got my career advancement to think about. Netanyahu has said there will be an invasion soon. Well, how about not accepting that and say, forget it. If you do that, there'll be sanctions. Act like a foreign secretary in waiting. Say we won't allow it. Of course, Starmer would no doubt sack you if you did that. It'd be something to wear with a badge of honour, of course, doing the right thing. And Starmer would look more of an Israeli shill than ever. But you'd win brownie points with the electorate. No. Nope. Dave's job and no doubt Dave's future Israel lobby donations mean more to him than doing the right thing does. Lamy was also interviewed on Sky by Trevor Phillips. That was another revealing exchange. David Lamy told Phillips that Palestinians must have access to water, medicines, food and electricity. So Phillips put to him that Israelis have turned out the lights. They're not supplying the water. The implication of that, based on what you've just said, is that the Israelis are wrong to do that. Just say yes, Dave. Nice easy question to answer. You left that hanging based on what you've already said. So it's obvious. Yes or no. So, of course, Lamy didn't do that. Instead, he contradicted himself within moments by saying, I'm not going to sit here as an armchair general or lawyer attempting to make assessments when I'm not on the ground and this is an operational situation. Yes or no, Dave? Are you with Israel, complicit in allowing them to commit war crimes by turning off water and electricity and food to civilians, or are you an actual human being and against that? Well, it seems he couldn't decide. We need a foreign secretary with courage to face down such things. Instead, in Lamy... We have one in the making that will only put himself first. My God, how is it possible that Labour can actually have a worse foreign secretary candidate than the one the Tories already have in post? The Tories have James Cleverly, for heaven's sake. A man that makes a marble look sharp. Here's a thought. If we were talking about Ukraine, I bet he'd be singing a different tune, wouldn't he? Russia bad. Putin bad. Easy to pick a side there, isn't it? A whole lot of difference when the interested, connected parties to the aggressors also happen to be amongst your funders, though, eh? Lamy is a coward, an arm-waving, angry, out-of-his-depth grifter who puts self-advancement above doing the right thing. Political lightweights like him we don't need. He's been on the gravy train for far too long, and we need change. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share, and subscribe if you did. More content out daily, and do leave a comment below and have your say on this. Be part of the conversation. What is your opinion on Lamy? Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Lamy had another epic foot in mouth moment when back in May he basically confirmed that Labour wouldn't be repeating any Tory legislation. Not that that's really news anymore at this point in time, but because they absolutely aren't. But confirming all the way back then that by voting for Starmer's Labour you were going to be getting more Tory, well, perhaps more people should have been taking note back then. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so 
Keir Starmer, fresh from being criticised for his apparent advocation for Israel to commit war crimes against the Palestinian people in order to get to Hamas, fresh from his backpedalling on this issue while still ardently supporting the occupying apartheid state, and fresh from getting his own letter from the International Centre of Justice for Palestinians, all covered in other videos already, do check my recent back catalogue. Well, now a legal blast from Starmer's past has hammered him as well for his tacit support of the Israeli state and every atrocity they're committing against people they have locked up in the biggest concentration camp of modern times that goes by the name of the Gaza Strip. And their intervention once more shines a light on Starmer, fundamentally having pretended to be somebody else to get to where he is today. An organisation that has actually barred him from ever rejoining them unless he changes his way away from the Red Tory Tony Blair Tribute Act he has become the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. And they've scorched him on his latest pathetic political positioning on what still looks to be a potential genocide of the Palestinian people. Right, so once upon a time, back when Keir Starmer was still pretending to be a socialist, he was a member of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. Because there is such a thing. Those lefty lawyers, Suella Braverman likes to make a song and dance about. Well, there legitimately are some, though these are the real ones and not the made-up ones that live rent-free in her head. Actually, not all members need to be lawyers, incidentally. The important part is the socialist bit. Haldane have existed since the 1930s as a legal and campaigning organisation independent of political parties, so not affiliated to anybody in particular in that regard. And they act as basically a forum to promote discussion and analysis of law and the legal system, both here in the UK and internationally, from a socialist point of view. And they've got quite a history of discussing human rights and civil liberties and racism and social justice. So them having their say on what is happening in the Middle East right now isn't a huge surprise, but they gave their former member the treatment whilst they did so too. Starmer wasn't just a former member of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, you see. He was once their secretary. But that all came to an end when, and I'm not sure you'll have heard this, it doesn't get discussed much, it's not particularly newsworthy, it would seem. And Starmer very much keeps this to himself. But he left Haldane when he got appointed to Director of Public Prosecutions at the Crown Prosecution Service in 2008. Because apparently being in charge of the CPS and being a socialist are incompatible. Make of that what you will. Alarm bells should have rung about his supposed socialist credentials way back then, I suppose. I've covered his record at the CPS in numerous other videos. I won't go into that again. We know Starmer is no socialist, though. Just look at the purging going on in his party, even to this day, where now voicing support for Palestine might see you get suspended or expelled, because he's effectively banned free speech from within his party. Coming nationwide, should he become Prime Minister, no doubt. So look out if you don't vote Labour. But back in 2021... The Haldane Society, clearly unable to expel Starmer for having turned out to be the lying red Tory toad he had become, far too late for that, he'd left in 2008, they still felt it relevant at their annual general meeting of that year in 2021 to pass a resolution banning Starmer from ever being able to rejoin them unless a vote be passed to overturn the resolution. They condemned him for his policy positions, notably his egging on a Boris Johnson to reopen schools faster during the pandemic, his clamp down on free speech, his disregard for migrant rights, his anti-trade unionism, his inaction on anti-black and anti-Muslim racism, still ongoing today of course despite the since published board report pointing it out to him, and his inaction over transgender abuse and a whole lot more besides. I can't imagine Starmer incidentally being in a hurry to rejoin them, he played his socialist con trick card and that genie isn't going back into the bottle now, but Again, Haldane have spoken out against Starmer as part of a wider statement condemning the atrocities happening in Gaza at this moment in time. It's quite lengthy. I'd happily advocate going to Haldane.org and reading the whole thing. It's currently on their main homepage. But it begins with, We recognise that the Israeli state is perpetrating a system of apartheid throughout historic Palestine, including in the occupied Palestinian territories, the OPT, in accordance with the racist ideology of Zionism. Along with the International Court of Justice and most jurists, we recognise the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. We recognise that Palestinians have a legally and morally unimpeachable right to resist Zionist colonialism, occupation and ethnic cleansing. This brutalisation is endorsed by so-called rule of law states that are funding the increased militarisation of Israel and the occupation. 
This has created an untenable situation of extreme and daily violence and conflict. We recognise that the fundamental cause of violence throughout the historic Palestine is Israel's settler colonial project and the Zionist ideology that animates it. No punch is pulled. You very much get where they're coming from here and you can see why Starmer's support for Zionism, without qualification, makes him an unsuitable future member again as well. The society statement goes into detail on condemning Israeli atrocity, pointing out the plight of Palestinians and the human rights abuses that they endure. They touch on the failures of the international community to hold Israel to account and particularly condemns the UK for the ongoing arms exports from here to Israel and criminalising protesters who target those arms factories, knowing what they are building there are likely to be used against Palestine. They reserve the tail end of their statement for Keir Starmer though, singling him out above any other politician. And you might argue that they did that because they have their own beef with him. But there's no denying his statements on this current Israel-Palestine calamity have been decidedly one-sided. On Starmer, Haldane have said, Sir Keir Starmer is the leader of the Labour Party in the UK and a former human rights lawyer. When asked on national radio whether cutting electricity and food were contrary to international law, Sir Keir said, Israel has a right to defend herself. It is an ongoing hostage situation and responsibility lies in one place, that is with Hamas. This amounts to an endorsement of collective punishment, war crimes and ongoing occupation. UN rapporteur on the OPT Francesca Albanese commented that it is extremely concerning that a senior politician expresses support for the commission of war crime and potentially a crime against humanity, such as intentional starvation of civilians when part of a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population. We expressly condemn Shakir's uncritical endorsement of Israeli war crimes as deeply irresponsible and as undermining international law. We also note the broader parallels in the usage of the word terrorism labelled to legitimise the brutalisation of Muslim people globally through the so-called war on terror, which has seen states, including the UK, engage in murder and displacement of millions. We call on Sakir to withdraw his remarks, which are incompatible with his duties as a lawyer, a politician and as a human being. As socialists and as lawyers, the Haldane Society supports peaceful negotiation and stands in unflinching solidarity with the people of Palestine in their justified struggle to liberate themselves from Israeli colonialism and apartheid. It isn't merely that the Israeli government should withdraw from Gaza, but that Israel's apartheid regime and the Zionist ideology that animates it should be dismantled entirely. We will be making a donation in solidarity to medical aid for Palestinians. That's a hammering, a deserved one, and yet one more message sent to Starmer that the general public, legal bodies, organisations, many of his own members, will not put up with the position he's taken on this. It's causing Labour a lot of damage, being on the wrong side of the argument, as they yet again are, with this absolute charlatan leading them. Because let's face it, when is Keir Starmer ever on the right side of an argument? Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Do leave a comment and have your say on this story as well. Be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation proving the Haldane Society's point where Starmer's Labour have now effectively censored any mention of Israeli apartheid, presumably because the exalted leader just doesn't like it. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so there's been a few posts over the last few days that I've noticed going around social media, more fallout from Keir Starmer's Labour unequivocally backing Israel, falling over itself to reassure the Jewish community, inverted commas, as if there is only one of those, that they are on their side. But where does that leave Muslim members? Palestinians are, for the most part, Muslim. And the entirely one-sided narrative coming from the party leadership is indicating that there could be significant fallout for Labour amongst its Muslim voters here as a result of its positioning. Are Muslims deserting the Labour Party over its staunch support and devotion to Israel here in the UK? Would that make an electoral difference? Or is that even actually the point when Labour under Starmer becomes seen as more anti-black and more Islamophobic? And this is arguably just the latest example of that from a party that seems not to care. Racist Labour losses. In that case, all that talk about Labour becoming less racist after the scam of weaponizing anti-Semitism is again being highlighted as the scam it always was. And indeed, the question that should be asked is just how much more racist is the party now under Starmer and how much more of it are Muslim members going to take, especially in light of some recent resignations? Right. So is the, is the Muslim vote deserting Labour over Starmer and co-stances towards Palestine, who they seem not to give a toss about? 
Starmer having said Israel has the right to turn off water and electricity to the Gaza Strip, which is a war crime and is a line I believe will haunt Starmer for all of time. It's not something he will ever be allowed to forget. The human rights lawyer who backed the commission of war crimes because it was Israel committing them and he's a Zionist without qualification. Well, the first notice I took of this actually building into something of a potential electoral issue, support issue, internal labour issue, was one of the many resignations to have come from the Labour Party in the wake of Starmer's appalling attitude towards Palestinians and Muslims in general and anti-black racism. Because this has been going on for a while now, but all of a sudden it's picked up in light of all of this. And it was notable because it was an elected Labour official whose resignation that I noticed. So it gained a little bit of attention from the media as well. Jesse Hoskin was a councillor on, or is a councillor on Stroud District Council, who quit the Labour Party over it, over what Starmer has been saying, with a statement that said, I am horrified by the loss of life in Israel and Palestine. Two million Palestinians in Gaza who had nothing to do with Hamas's actions should not be punished collectively for it. We are witnessing atrocities. All targeting of civilian life should be condemned. I have had the support of other Stroud District Labour councillors in unequivocally distancing myself from comments made by Keir Starmer and senior shadow ministers supporting war crimes against Palestinian people. The Labour Party is no longer consistent with the values of human dignity, equality, a world where everyone is safe and has what they need to thrive that I believe in and will continue to organise in other areas of my work. Hoskin had been a Labour member for eight years, a councillor for two. Starmer, incidentally, had 15 Labour councillors on Stroud District Council at the last set of elections held there in 2021. Hoskin is actually the 11th Labour councillor there to become independent since then, since 2021. Such has been the scale of resignations there. But that was just the first I noticed to resign, specifically in light of Starmer's comments and advocation for war crimes to be committed against Palestinians, as it seems to be that that's what he said. Oxford City Council has lost not one but two of its Labour councillors in one go over this. Shaista Aziz and Dr Amar Latif, both themselves Muslim, who issued a joint statement which said, Following the horrific killings and atrocities inflicted on Israelis and Palestinians over the past six days, and the deep devastation, grief and fear being felt by communities in our city and beyond, we are deeply disappointed and alarmed at the Labour Party leader Keir Starmer's comments seeming to condone the use of collective punishment against the people of Gaza in direct contravention of international law. We have sought to seek urgent clarification regarding these statements, both from the national and local leadership. Unfortunately, as no clarification has been forthcoming, we have made a conscious decision to immediately resign the whip and leave the Labour Party. As Gaza faces its most darkest hours with an Israeli military invasion imminent and the UN warning of a catastrophe unfolding, we are appalled at the lack of humanity and regard for the rights of Palestinian people, the upholding and protection of international law and protections of civilians and civilian infrastructure. We are appalled by those who seek to justify the killing of Israeli men, women and children in Hamas terrorist attacks. We are horrified by the rhetoric of Labour politicians saying Israel is justified in cutting off Gaza's water, food and electricity supply. This is a form of collective punishment, illegal under international law, and these statements must be condemned fully and withdrawn immediately. Now this one I found interesting in that they sought clarification from higher up the party chain on these statements. and They got ignored. It says a lot of what Labour think of their locally elected officials, doesn't it? And indeed, if that's how they are treated, what about ordinary members just as disgusted then? I'm not surprised they resigned. Solidarity to them both. But it reminded me of another comment I'd seen from the odious Jewish news hack, Lee Harpin, the go-to leaker, it seems, for the Labour right wing, who tweeted out yesterday the words from one of his anonymous Labour sources. Yes, one of those again. And he, he said... Labour source on the few quitting party over a party stance on Hamas. Shaking off the fleas. It's a very telling phrase, assuming Harpin is telling the truth here, which is, in my opinion, a stretch. Very close to the anti-Semitic trope the Nazis used to describe Jews, referring to them as parasites or fleas because they were incapable of forming a state of their own. And so, to their mind, they infiltrated other states. Propaganda used to justify the Holocaust and all of that. Horrible by any stretch of the imagination, of course. Interestingly, though, some Zionists also used the term, almost agreeing with the Nazi interpretation by dismissing a parasitic way of life as the need for there to be a Jewish state. But yes, the Jewish parasite trope 
this statement comes awfully close to in my mind. And again, it makes you look at Labour and wonder if the real racists are actually gone or just took over instead. I've now learned while writing this that another Labour councillor, Amna Abdul Latif of Manchester City Council, has quit the Labour Party. Her statement might be the most damning yet. She said, I have been a member of the Labour Party for the last decade and proud to have been elected in 2019 as the first Arab Muslim woman to represent Manchester City Council in my home of Ardwick. In that time, I have worked alongside the incredible community I've been honoured to represent and many dedicated Labour activists. I joined Labour because its values of justice and equality reflected my own, and it saddens me that I no longer feel that this is the case under the current leadership of the party. I am devastated to now have no choice other than to resign the Labour whip and resign from the Labour Party due to Keir Starmer and a number of his senior front bench making horrifying comments about Israel having the right to withhold fuel, water, food and electricity from the 2.2 million Palestinians trapped in Gaza, effectively endorsing a war crime. I am appalled by the lack of humanity being shown to Palestinians by the party I have been a member of for the last 10 years. Collective punishment is illegal under international law. It is inhumane and unconscionable. I cannot fathom how the leadership of the party I represent has not called for a de-escalation of violence and a ceasefire. This is deeply irresponsible and dangerous. I mourn the loss of innocent lives in Israel and in Gaza. I stand in solidarity with the Jewish community in Manchester who have been deeply impacted by terror as well as our Palestinian and Muslim community in our city and all those feeling sadness, fear and shock. I stand in solidarity with all people seeking justice, peace and coexistence. First Arab Muslim elected to Manchester City Council and she's gone. She can't fathom how the leadership of the party won't call for a de-escalation and a ceasefire. Who can? Why have they not called for that? Well, in the case of the likes of David Lammy or Emily Thornbury, it would be apparent that that seems to be fear for their own position, since Starmer is so hardline, he'd sack them for such dissent in a heartbeat. They're careerists. But Starmer, I just don't believe he cares. If he did, he wouldn't still be ignoring the findings of the Ford report, spelling out the disproportionate priority given to anti-Semitism over all other forms of racism in his party, and wouldn't ignore the blatant anti-black and Islamophobic issues within his party. That report and the Labour League's report highlighted and identified. He does not care. Some of those supporting him clearly don't either. Fleas and all of that. Another seven councillors in Leicester have called for a retraction. That's after Starmer purged 17 Leicester city councillors, chiefly non-white ones, earlier this year going into the local elections. Will any of those he has left there go next? Will any more councillors or elected officials around the country resign next? As time of writing, perhaps some more have actually already gone. Who knows? But these are all elected party officials leaving in horror and disgust. How many members have done likewise? Can only be more. ITV News' Shiab Khan has tweeted out that councillors he has spoken to are considering resigning, some of which could see Labour actually lose control of several councils. Some of these are waiting to see if a retraction actually comes from Starmer and Co, but so far none has. A change in language in a statement Starmer put out swiftly after getting a warning letter from the International Centre of Justice for Palestinians isn't the same as an apology and a retraction. Is he so supremely arrogant that he thinks he can get away with this, that he doesn't owe that? Well, we are still waiting. After the resignation of Jesse Hoskin, Navarra Media's Aaron Bastani said, going to see so much of this, anecdotally being told all weekend of Muslim voters saying Starmer's statement is a deal breaker for them and the party, totally and utterly avoidable. Absolutely right too, and with seemingly no interest in damage limitation that an apology and withdrawal of remarks would go some way towards from Starmer either. How many seats in the UK could this affect, at parliamentary level even? I couldn't hardly hazard a guess. But Muslim communities, I do know, have always historically backed Labour predominantly. If Labour have lost any significant part of that vote, for instance, to the Greens, well, that could be the difference between them winning and losing an election. All I know is that I never want to see that man in number 10, and it is past time someone in those cowardly Labour backbenches stood up and challenged him. That they're still, even now, sat there like church mice is pathetic. What do you reckon, though? Could the loss of the Muslim vote, or enough of it, be the difference for Labour come the general election or not? 
Are you a Muslim Labour voter? Are you still backing the party? Or have you drawn a line in the sand at what you've seen from the party leadership say and do here? Do let me know in the comments below. Share your thoughts and be part of the conversation as always. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where another anti-black and Islamophobic row broke out in the Labour Party earlier this year. We saw an entire constituency Labour Party collapse up in Copeland, all because Labour wanted a Muslim candidate, or the local Labour members wanted a Muslim candidate, but the Labour leadership, well, they didn't, did they? And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so last night, social media was pretty much talking about only one thing and one thing only, and that was the appalling spectacle of a hospital in Gaza being blown to bits by a missile attack. Who targets a hospital? Fatalities are numbering in the high hundreds at time of writing. Whose missile, though? Well, if you talk to Israel, they've given several conflicting accounts of the matter. If you speak to Palestinians, they are very much saying it is Israel. If you speak to any number of other Middle East countries, they're saying Israel too. Western countries more likely to say the opposite. But of course we need to prove all of this, and yet the media and our politicians are refusing to highlight what appears to be obvious, even when there is evidence to point to, circumstantial such as it might be, but certainly enough to prompt some urgent questions to the authorities concerned. Right, so there's no escaping the news that the Al-Ali Baptist Hospital in northern Gaza has been hit by a missile, killing hundreds of people who've been inside. This is probably one of the worst examples of innocent blood being spilt needlessly this century. And short of being a complete sociopath, your heart breaks for the people and the families affected by this horrific course of events. This tragedy where a hospital gets targeted during a war. It's civilian infrastructure. Surely, for crying out loud, it ought to be a no-go zone, even if your enemy might use such places to hide. The Baptist Hospital is separate from Gazan Health Infrastructure. It's standalone and self-sufficient, self-contained, set up 141 years ago by the Church of England's Christian Mission Society, and now it is gone, along with so many people who were inside. With fuel, food, water and electricity having been cut off, many people from the north of Gaza, despite the Israeli order to evacuate and head south, could not do so. Many chose the hospital to shelter in. So on top of patients and staff, who also couldn't evacuate, having no way to move their patients, a great many others were seeking refuge there too, believing that Israel wouldn't target a hospital, that not even they would go there. So it looks very much like they might just have done. Now I'm not just saying that as someone who is pro-Palestinian here, I've been calling Israel out for its apartheid for a long time, regular viewers know this, it's not a new thing, but there is ample, albeit still circumstantial evidence, pointing to Israel as the perpetrators of this attack. So let's start with the lead up to these events. Israel gave the 1.1 or 1.2 million people who live in the north of Gaza 24 hours to evacuate and move south. It didn't matter what building you might occupy there. Everyone was told 24 hours. Now this got extended when various bodies and organisations like the UN pointed out how impossible it was to evacuate that many people that quickly with resources cut off and all of that. But there were no exceptions made in this demand at all. Why ask the likes of schools and hospitals to evacuate if you didn't mean to bomb them? I'm of a mind that this imposed exodus of Palestinians from north to south is about another potential land grab on the part of Israel, hence why they want the entire region cleared. Hamas will still have their hostages. Surely you aren't so concerned for innocence if you want Palestinians out so you can be more indiscriminate in your attacks, not if you want those hostages back alive, though. So there was the request to evacuate the hospital. Now, somebody interviewed in the wake of the missile attack yesterday was Canon Sewell of the Jerusalem Diocese, who confirmed Israel hit Al Ali Baptist Hospital, which the diocese has responsible for, last Saturday. He called that a warning shot at the time to people that it was not a safe place to stay. The missile hit on Saturday, believed to have been Israeli, his words, and it caused significant damage in and of itself, enough to injure four people. So last night's attack wasn't even the first strike on the hospital. There's more evidence to point to, though. The biggest piece of evidence implicating Israel in the attack came from pro-Israel social media influencer Hanania Naftali, who tweeted out before deleting his post that the Israeli Air Force struck a Hamas terrorist base inside a hospital in Gaza. A multiple number of terrorists are dead. He hurriedly deleted this. Presumably he backtracked on it when the scale of civilian loss of life became apparent, but he then changed it to a post then blaming Hamas for the attack. So what does a social media influencer know about this anyway, you might be thinking? Well, he actually happens to work for Benjamin Netanyahu. He's digital spokesman for the IDF. 
In fact, Naftali and Netanyahu were actually rather close. Netanyahu gushed about his employee in a speech he gave at Naftali's wedding, no less. That's how close he is to the regime. Nothing quite says innocent like not getting your story straight, though. Naftali wasn't the only one struggling. The general messaging coming out of Israel has been, we bombed it. Uh, no, we didn't bomb it. What do you mean a hospital has been bombed? We don't know anything about that. Oh, that hospital. Well, that was a mass. It didn't even stop at that point, though. Then it moved to, oh, they were warned to evacuate. It's their own fault if they didn't. Never mind that they literally couldn't. But the latest has been that it was a failed Islamic Jihad rocket that did it. They're an aligned group with Hamas, but for Israel, they smack of being another convenient scapegoat, one that happened to also backfire on them when it emerged this excuse was based on a piece of video footage of an Islamic Jihad strike, but it wasn't the same one. It wasn't the one on the hospital, as the timestamp showed the Islamic Jihad strike took place 40 minutes after the hospital was hit. So why would Israel push knowingly false information? Former Corbyn speechwriter Alex Nunns made a great comment on just this. He said, isn't it funny that Israel instantly knows the exact location of Islamic Jihad rocket launches, yet didn't target them with airstrikes? If we're to believe their story, we'd have to assume the thousands of residential buildings they're blowing up are a more, more urgent priority. Seems I'm not the only one that might be thinking of a land grab into the opportunity that is being seized here. But here's the thing, though. Israel gets billions of dollars in aid from around the world, mostly the U.S., they have arms manufacturing bases here in the UK. Those Elbit Systems sites that keep getting targeted by protesters. Targeted with good intent, in my opinion, given what they manufacture, fundamentally amounts to being death. Palestine, Hamas, they don't have these top-of-the-range arms to hand. They build them themselves. They build glorified, homemade fireworks, pretty much, and call them rockets. They don't have anything like the punch of the Israeli weaponry. Um, and Israel, funnily enough, loved to mock the inaccuracy of these rockets and how often they actually misfire. So it's crazy that Hamas happened to have got a rocket that's not only powerful enough to kill hundreds of people in a hospital, but that they've misfired and happened to hit that hospital twice in the space of four days. Well, that's enormously bad luck, isn't it? In fact, let's make it potentially three times in four days. As there's some reports at time of writing, I've seen a piece of footage, but it's not confirmed when it took place that I've seen, and I like to check everything. That humanitarian workers looking to find people amongst the rubble of the Baptist Hospital have been targeted by another airstrike. So that's incredibly bad shooting on the part of Hamas, isn't it? Yeah, and pigs might fly. So there's a fair bit of evidence. Circumstantial, yes, floating around. But there is a fair bit of it. So in light of all of that, what are our politicians saying about this? What would their next line be, you wonder? Israel has the right to defend itself against hospitals? That seems to be the level of discourse we experience, isn't it? That line of theirs that they trot out in every media interview, their ongoing support for the aggressors just eggs them on to be more aggressive, more extreme, to do worse things in the belief they'll get away with it. And every single politician defending Israel has gas and blood on their hands now as a result. Regardless of their opinions, regardless of what our media are saying, and I have to say, there seems to be a bit of a shift in some media narrative. If you haven't seen Sky News' Anna Botting's recent interview, clips going around on social media, where she absolutely shreds that arrogant career apologist for Israel, Mark Regev, it's a truly wonderful sight. An example of how brilliant our media could be if they really were free and fearless and not bought and paid for. However, it's ordinary people, the likes of you and I, that have been the change here. And after that missile strike, across the Middle East and beyond, demonstrations spontaneously erupted across the Middle East in solidarity with Palestine in the wake of that missile attack on that hospital. In Palestine Square in Iran, at the Israeli embassy in Jordan, which protesters set on fire, I don't condone that, at the Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli embassy again in Ankara, demonstrations in Baghdad, in Tunisia, they gathered outside the French embassy to protest both about the Israeli war crimes and Western complicity in it. And there were more protesters in Beirut in Lebanon, the Israeli consulate in Istanbul in Yemen, and in Hebron in the West Bank. The hospital wasn't the only example of Israeli atrocity yesterday either. Going vastly underreported as a result of the hospital strike story's dominance is the fact Israel again bombed southern Gaza, the very place they instructed 1.1 million people from northern Gaza to go to to be safe. They then bombed them anyway, and the targets included Rafah, where the only exit from Gaza into Egypt lies, and where many Gazans are gathering in order to get out into Egypt. A hundred people have reportedly been killed in those strikes too. So if Israel are bombing people who are evacuating, as we saw in that terrible attack on a convoy heading south out of northern Gaza the other day, and they repeatedly now hit southern Gaza where they told these people to go, when apparently Hamas are in the north, 
the reason we're told the evacuation is being called for, why are they blatantly targeting civilians as their southern strikes imply? Why are they, as a result of those strikes, preventing people leaving and going into Egypt? And if they could do all of that, why is it so hard to believe they wouldn't strike a hospital? Well, perhaps the words of the Israeli president from the day before the hospital strike might answer some of that. The Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, said in a speech, we are working, operating militarily according to the rules of international law, period, unequivocally. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up, fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. But we are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are defending our homes. We are protecting our homes. That's the truth. And when a nation protects its own, it fights. And we will fight until we break their backbone. He's talking about an area where over 1 million of the 2.1 million population are children and most are under 14. And he wants to break their backbones and he blames them for Hamas. And you really think it's people like this whose rockets mostly consist of little more than glorified fireworks can bomb out a hospital not once but twice. First time accurately enough to act as a warning. Second time to devastating effect. A third time allegedly targeting the humanitarian workers searching the wreckage for signs of life. Come off it. Social media is challenging a genocide right now in a way the world has never seen before. It is exposing everything that you know normally wouldn't get out. It will absolutely continue to do so because if we keep the pressure up, we might affect a change. Israel's backtracking in the face of global condemnation led by those online calling it out, not by mainstream sources still supporting Israel as being the difference maker. Let's keep it up because if Israel did this, and of course, this still does need definitive, independent verification. I will make that point because it is important. But if they can get away with bombing hospitals now, they will do it again and again. And just before I finish, I have to become aware of one more piece of evidence, something Al Jazeera have reported on, no less. A tweet put out by the Israeli army in Arabic Facebook page. So everything on it is in Arabic. Uh, I believe this is uh, it's the Facebook page, I believe. I think some reports have said it came from Twitter, but I think it's Facebook. And again, it's been deleted already anyway, so I can't check it myself. Which, when translated, and this is likely why it hasn't been picked up until somebody had done that a bit later. Uh, it said, due to the lack of medical supplies and medical staff, it has been decided to bomb the Baptist hospital in Gaza and give them euthanasia. Now that's the closest to a confession that I've seen. And if that does get confirmed, Israel are busted. What do you reckon, though? Israel, missile or not, convinced of that or still in doubt? Do you have your say in the comments below and be part of the conversation? Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where is that Israeli evacuation order, impossible as it was, didn't get called out by our supposed leaders at the time. So there's this chap called Jeremy Corbyn you might have heard of. He did chip in and had something to say about it. And Well, I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so the USA and the UK have just kiboshed humanitarian aid to Gaza, making you wonder truly how in hot to the Israeli state they must be to deny something as basic as essentials like food and water, as well as medicine and medical aid. Last night, the United Nations Security Council met after days of negotiations and discussions to hopefully pass a resolution that would have paused events between Israel and Gaza in order to establish a humanitarian response, whilst also condemning the Hamas attack on Israel. It was on the face of it, and in light of these most recent events, the historical aspect of occupation aside, conciliatory towards both parties. Aid needs to get into Gaza. Hamas should be condemned. That's the here and now that needs to be established, surely, bare minimum. However, the resolution failed because the US voted against it, whilst the UK, along with Russia, chose to abstain. Right, so how deeply devoted are the United States, the UK and Russia, on the face of it, to the apartheid state of Israel, that they can't even bring themselves to vote to pass a resolution to pause the shooting and the bombing and the killing to let some aid into the world's largest open-air prison half of whose population are kids. Well, here's a photo of Joe Biden meeting the chief occupier Benjamin Netanyahu here. I think that pretty much says it all, doesn't it? Now, there's 15 countries on the United Nations Security Council, and unfortunately, it's hardly a democratic representative body, because some votes are worth more than others, which is why the US voting against this resolution on its own was enough to veto it. The nations sitting on the Security Council currently are Albania, Brazil, China, Ecuador, France, Gabon, Ghana, Japan, Malta, Mozambique, 
Russia, Switzerland, the United Arab Emirates, the UK and the US. However, five of those countries are permanent members of the council. In other words, these, those nations are always present on it. Other countries will come and go. And for some reason that I cannot fathom the justification of, though, these five permanent members, seemingly just by virtue that they happen to be permanent members, get a veto over resolution so that if any one of them were to vote against something, that will supersede however many countries might vote for it. It might offer a bit of clarity as well as to why so many people regard the UN as a little bit pointless, a little bit useless. Because when it is so difficult to get anything passed, like we're seeing here, it's a little wonder people think that way, is it? It's a farce, quite frankly. Anyway, this particular resolution had been drafted by Brazil, and it was actually the second referendum to get a humanitarian ceasefire passed, following the bigger defeat of a Russia-drafted resolution, which omitted to contain any condemnation of Hamas, more countries on the Security Council did not like that. So the Brazilian resolution did include condemnation of Hamas to placate those who didn't appreciate that particular omission. But the main point of this entire affair is to get aid to where it is needed before more people needlessly die for lack of support and obviously a ceasefire respected by both sides. Not something Israel has a great track record on, it has to be said. But who can find fault with that, surely? Nobody. Except it wasn't so much what was in the resolution this time around that was such a massive issue for the US, but what wasn't. The US on the Security Council has a lengthy and shameful record of letting Israel off the hook by vetoing resolutions. And it did just that again here. What was the US issue with it? Well, US Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield was quite open and honest about why her country, why she vetoed this vote on humanitarian aid by saying, This resolution did not mention Israel's right of self-defence. Right, so people could die for lack of aid because the resolution wasn't deferential enough to Israel, is that it? Aid had already been denied because the Russian resolution wasn't tough enough on Hamas. Now it was still being denied because the UN wasn't being sufficiently subservient to Israel for the United States liking. Now as far as the UN and its protocols go, she's right in that the resolution should have included Israel's right to self-defence. I would argue Palestinians have that right too. Not Hamas, Palestinians. Let's not fudge the two. Israel's right to self-defense is included in the UN's charter, so she is not wrong to raise it, but why veto the entire resolution when you could have just introduced this additional line as an amendment? You could have just amended the Brazilian resolution to include that. You didn't, so I can only conclude the US wanted this to fail. Linda Thomas-Greenfield continued, though. She had more to say, bringing up the fact that the US is engaged in on-the-ground diplomacy right as we speak, with the visit of President Joe Biden, very friendly with Netanyahu, as we've already seen, and other senior officials who went with him. She said, yes, resolutions are important, and yes, this council must speak out, but the actions we take must be informed by the facts on the ground and support direct diplomacy that can save lives. Well, you'd save more lives by acting now instead of waiting until later for someone else to. Israel had just welcomed the most powerful politician on the planet. You really think they'd allow him to be placed in any danger right now? So how hard would a ceasefire right now really be to deliver? How many would die because you put your faith in Bibi's buddy Biden? Now, although the US vote is what defeated this resolution, there's no ignoring the fact two other countries chose to abstain as well, failing to support aid going to where it is urgently needed, choosing to sit on their hands instead, and to no surprise at all, it seems, we're at fault here as well. The UK abstaining over saying something a bit cross to Israel, maybe, and demanding aid go to Gaza. I mean, Sunak just declared £10 million of aid to go to Gaza, so why the hell are we abstaining over this? Time out. Uh, our ambassador spoke up, I think. What was her reasoning then? Well, she's basically swallowed Rishi Sunak's last speech on the matter, it would seem. The UK ambassador, Barbara Woodward, said that her country abstained from the resolution that we abstained as the text needed to be clearer on Israel's inherent right to self-defence and because it ignored the fact that Hamas, which controls Gaza, is using Palestinian civilians as human shields. She said they have embedded themselves in civilian communities and made the Palestinian people their victims too. So the UK basically holds exactly the same position as the US again. Could have introduced an amendment to include Israel's right to self-defence. Again, this wasn't done. I mean, introducing an amendment is one of the most basic political mechanisms going. How is this beyond national ambassadors, for heaven's sake? In our case, however, despite the condemnation of Hamas in the Brazilian resolution, it didn't condemn Hamas strongly enough for our liking, apparently. 
Hamas might well be dug in around residential places. That is giving Israel the excuse to bomb them. Places like hospitals, for example. More evidence mounting against Israel over the Al Ali Baptist hospital strike since my video on that yesterday, incidentally. Aside from that, though, Hamas is a Gazan entity, yet we're seeing mounting attacks by Israel in the West Bank now as well. And in footage shown by Sky News, it happened whilst they ha this, and this happened whilst they were happening to film some unrest in the West Bank for protesters who were throwing stones at IDF vehicles. Stones, because that's what they got to arm themselves with, were shot dead by snipers in response. That's hardly proportional response, is it? And the Hamas have no presence there in the West Bank beyond ties to other militant groups that are at work there, far smaller, far less powerful. It's just another weak, pathetic response from us. The other abstaining party, of course, though, was Russia, who tried to pass the previous resolution. So on the face of it, they've abstained on this resolution because criticism of Hamas got included. It's a bit more complicated than that, actually, because although Russia are in communication with Hamas, apparently, they are also in communication with Netanyahu, although apparently things have cooled off a bit between him and Putin of late. At any rate, and proving as amendments could be brought to this resolution, Russia actually tried to amend this twice and were defeated both times because they felt the resolution as it was didn't make clear the call for a ceasefire and wouldn't help stop the bloodshed. Therefore, their ambassador, Vasily Nebenzia, proposed amendments that called to end indiscriminate attacks on civilians and infrastructure in Gaza and the condemnation of the imposition of the blockade on the enclave and added a new point for a call for a humanitarian ceasefire. Nebenzia went on by saying, if these are not included in the current draft, it would not help to address the human situation in Gaza and polarised positions of the international community. They didn't pass, and so Russia abstained. Again, it speaks volumes to those who would vote such amendments down. We've seen civilians targeted and killed in Gaza. Over a thousand children have been killed in a week. They aren't Hamas. Reinforcing the need for a humanitarian ceasefire is the humane response. Is this not what you're trying to achieve here? Or is it more about letting Israel off the hook for war crimes under the guise of some sort of form of humanitarianism? A sham in which case. Condemnation of the fact Israel keeps Gazans in a concentration camp too, which the whole world knows it does. More people now than ever before, I'm sure. And still, no, we can't criticise Israel for that either. We don't dare. It's been another shameful example of hand-wringing by government after government afraid of or unwilling to criticise the apartheid state of Israel. We need better leaders if that's the case, if this is what they think representing us on the world stage means. It's not good enough. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do leave a comment below and be part of the conversation on this. Let me know your thoughts about what happened here, how it makes you feel. Sickens me. I'd love to know. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where with ambassadors and diplomats and officials here seemingly acting in self-interest rather than as representatives, how can I not recommend my coverage of David Lammy's shamelessness from the weekend? Where he literally told Victoria Derbyshire that he's putting his own career aspirations first in these Middle East matters, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Israel, it would appear, have just managed to expose themselves as being the likely perpetrators of the Al Ali hospital attack through the very convenient production of an audio sound clip claiming to be two Palestinians talking about what happened and Palestinian Islamic Jihad being behind it. But Channel 4 have, in what I have to say, is a rare moment of me giving props to a mainstream media outlet, had it checked out, and it's fake. For Israel to have produced something like this so quickly, in the aftermath of events with global implications, with it desperate for public relations to be on their side around the world, with their ongoing portrayal as being victims themselves. This is gutsy reporting from media not usually known for it, and with massive implications for political and social discourse going forwards. Right, so Israel may have jumped the shark this time, and there may not be any way back from this this time. The Channel 4 report itself, a uh, brilliant piece of journalism uh, for a change, began as a look at the current state of Gaza and the damage done by an Israeli airstrike with concrete buildings pancaked, as they put it, completely flattened, reduced to rubble. Structural collapse was widespread over a given area around the site of impact. When where individual missiles happened to hit open ground and missed buildings, there were clearly well-defined large craters. And then they moved on to the state of things today at the Al Ali Baptist Hospital, which was the scene of so much devastation and the loss of so much life. 
But they did this in order to look at the damage there and do a little bit of a compare and contrast with what they'd just shown. And this was beginning to turn into a little bit of a detective story at this point. The craters in the grounds of the hospital were small, so they were the sort of things that you would expect from mortar shell impacts or artillery fire rather than a missile. Where the damage from an airstrike covers a large area surrounding the point of impact, that is not the case at the hospital or in the area of the hospital where Channel 4 decided to take a look around at the surrounding buildings, which had only suffered superficial damage. An adjoining church, for example, didn't even lose a single window, let alone be raised to the ground. So what does that tell us then? Well, it tells us that it wasn't a ground detonating missile that hit the hospital. It can't have been. There would have been more surrounding damage. As Channel 4 point out, though, that doesn't rule out some kind of an air burst munition, something that exploded in the air above, not making direct content, something that can still result in major loss of life, albeit with less structural damage. And this then brought the report to Israel's explanation of the events. And of course, as I covered in a recent video, they've come out with all sorts of excuses from there being no missile to not being their missile, to it being Hamas's missile, to it being Islamic Jihad's missile. The messaging has been very mixed and absolutely that has raised suspicions. But what Channel 4 have also uncovered them saying might just be the smoking gun, if you can forgive the unfortunate analogy. Now all the excuses they'd come out with on the night, the demonstrations that kicked off across the Middle East uh, that night, the demonstrations that have been occurring worldwide, that's still going on today as the protests in Congress in the US as well. Israel knew from all of this reaction that they had a massive problem on their hands, that if they didn't deal with this quickly, if they couldn't prove it was Hamas responsible or one of their allies, then this was going to reflect horribly on them. And so it appears they got to work that night to get out a piece of audio the next day, allegedly of a conversation between two Palestinians discussing the hospital strike. So they held a big press conference in the morning and this led to the official response claim we've all heard now that a misfiring Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket was to blame. Daniel Hagari, the Israeli Defense Forces head of spokespersons unit, announced at that press conference that, according to our intelligence, Hamas checked the reports, understood it was an Islamic Jihad rocket that had misfired, and decided to launch a global media campaign to hide what really happened. Well, really, Daniel. The damage survey Channel 4 conducted have already, it would appear, and that case is compelling, that this was not a ground-based detonation. Besides, this conference statement implies that Gazan-based terrorists, with the internet already having been cut off by Israel, by the way, mounted a global disinformation campaign that night. Really? You really think we're going to believe that one? You think we're really going to swallow that one? Sure. Okay, of course you do. Well, then it got to the audio clip, the proof, as it were, or wasn't. Anyway, they played it, and on the recording are two voices, who they claim to be two Hamas operatives, and they're saying... I'm telling you, this is the first time that we see a missile like this falling. That's why we are saying it belongs to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So now Israel is saying it was Hamas, and they're now just blaming Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I wish they'd make their minds up who they're blaming here. I'm getting confused by it. Hamas, naturally, have, does not deny this is them, called it an obvious fabrication. But here's the thing. Channel 4 took that audio clip to two independent Arab journalists, and they've told them the same thing. Now, some of you might think, well, hang on, Hamas are Arabs, Palestinians are Arabs. Is this really impartial of Channel 4 to have taken them to taken this clip to other Arabs to, to analyse? But what I'm talking about here isn't some kind of technical audio analysis. That, it would seem, wasn't necessary. Perhaps it'll come, yet. Yeah. It's like somebody from London and somebody from Newcastle talking. To our ears here in the UK, we can easily tell who comes from where. Both are going to be English by their accents. And, and this is where Israel have fundamentally come unstuck, because the Arab journalists listening to the men speaking on the clip, because the language they use, the accent, the dialect, the syntax, and the tone of the two men speaking, made it obviously clear to them that the people who were speaking in that clip were not Palestinian. The claim that the clip is authentic is simply not credible in their opinions. In other words, Israel have fabricated it to get the heat off them. There was more than just this to debunk Israeli claims, though. Israel claims the Islamic Jihad missile was launched from a cemetery close to the hospital. This is just to the west. Israel had previously published some video which allegedly showed the missile heading towards the hospital. But that video footage implied the rocket came from the east, not the west. And given how close by they allege the location it was launched from is, the rocket was launched at far too high a trajectory. 
The little conference presentation apparently managed to contradict itself too, hilariously, in this regard. There's another slide in the same conference alleged the missile came from the southwest instead and not the west. So they can't even get their own presentation straight. Such is the panic, such is the rush to get something out to get the heat off them, it seems. Well, which was it? Because obviously you have to be wrong about one of these locations, and in which case, why should we believe you about either of them? But on the flip side, Islamic Jihad have claimed it was an Israeli missile, and they've said that they've got a warhead to prove it, but they couldn't actually produce it for Channel 4. So them being dishonest too doesn't help their cause either, and it does fudge all of this unhelpfully. But it does very much look like Israel have blatantly fabricated evidence to try and prove it was not them, in which case, what exactly have they got to hide? It's just one more piece of evidence, still circumstantial, in a case that seems to be stacking up more and more against Israel, though, for striking that hospital. And they've been caught red-handed fibbing on this occasion. What do you reckon? Time they fessed up. Do have your say in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where, when we're speaking of dishonesty, how about that bit when Benjamin Netanyahu denied knowing Hamas were going to attack Israel, despite Egypt warning them it was going to happen? Did he allow his own citizens to be targeted? In which case, we still haven't got an answer to that, have we? But here's my take on it, and I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so two by-elections took place yesterday, two Tory defences, two massive Tory defeats, as the media and the pollsters are telling us. And, of course, the Tories knew this was on the cards. That's why their weakling leader and our embarrassment of a Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, scuttled off to Israel for polling day. He's toast. But as is often the case, the media headlines and commentary aren't actually telling people the truth of the situation. The implication being that there's been this big, massive shift from the Tories to Labour who won both seats, despite themselves now being led by a self-declared supporter of war crimes. So what is the story of these by-elections and what do they actually tell us going forwards? Right, so two by-elections yesterday, Tamworth in Staffordshire and Mid-Bedfordshire, both triggered by a pair of Tories whose reputations were in tatters, along with their parties, of course. Yet still, both of these seats were, on the face of it, staunch Tory state ground. Let's deal with Tamworth first. The incumbent Tory MP there had, of course, been Chris Pincher. Pincher by name, Pincher by nature, who, of course, was found to have been a bit handsy with other men when drunk and having caused embarrassment at the Carlton Hotel, allegedly groping two men, he was suspended. It subsequently came out that there were another six allegations against Pincher for similar going back a decade. Of course, none of that had stopped Boris Johnson appointing him as a whip, despite knowing about all of that. But when a whip is being accused of abuse, who can you go to to complain if you're an MP? That's what the whip is there for, isn't it? Shows what importance Johnson put on such matters, didn't it? Anyway, Pincher was found guilty by the Common Select Committee on Standards and was suspended for eight weeks. He appealed that, that failed, so then he resigned, rather than be triggered through a trigger ballot of his constituents, though the resignation wasn't really a resignation because he got appointed to the office of steward and bailiff of the manor of Northstead, which is just a parliamentary fiddle that means resigning as an MP without overtly saying so, in order to save face, basically. It's really quite pathetic. But anyway, so we come to the by-election. The Tories were in trouble because of their man, and he had gone in shame. So their replacement needed to be squeaky clean, despite the fact this truly is a very safe seat. In 2019, Pincher won the seat with a majority of over 19,000, so they'd have to be in real trouble to lose it, eh? Enter one Andrew Cooper, who it soon came out was one of those people who believed anyone needing more money to feed their kids, but who happened to have a mobile phone, a TV, or bought makeup, for example, should F off. In fact, he was so devoted to this mindset that he even went as far as drawing up a flowchart about it and putting it all over social media. Whoops, now we've seen it. So he was in bother from the beginning too because of that. Labour put up Sarah Edwards, a Sharon Graham staffer at Unite previously, apparently. So nice to know Sharon Graham is so cosy with Keir Starmer these days that there's no problem with her get, her people getting selected to be Labour candidates. Now the media are talking about Edwards winning in terms of swing, because they always talk in terms of swing, don't they? Massive majority overcome, that 19,000 majority the Tories had. A swing to Labour of 23.9% was seismic, huge! based on that measure. The Labour vote was up 22%. The Tory vote was down 25%. It seemed clear 
that all the Tories went to Labour pretty much, doesn't it? Shame it wasn't true. Back in 2019, when Labour came a distant second, it has to be said, they won 10,908 votes, a respectable but distant 23.7% of the vote. Last night, Sarah Edwards won just 811 more votes than Labour got in 2019. She actually got over 4,600 fewer votes than Labour got in 2017 before the party succeeded in sabotaging Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Yet those 811 more votes meant Labour ended up winning 45.8% of the vote this time around. Our electoral system is a farce and the way we measure it is a joke. But how can so few more votes deliver such a massive extra vote share? Of course the answer is turnout. Turnout in Tamworth yesterday was dire, even by by-election standards. Just 35.9% turnout, which worked out at some 20,000 fewer people voting. Funnily enough, the Tory vote fell from 30,542 in 2019 to just 10,403 last night. So roughly 20,000 fewer votes then. And that's your answer. Tory voters stayed at home and didn't vote at all for the most part. But two thirds of all of them that turned out in 2019 stayed at home. That's why Labour ended up winning. They didn't really increase their vote share in any meaningful way whatsoever. In truth, their vote simply held up and the Tories didn't. So in no way is this an endorsement of Starmer at all, but a massive condemnation of the Tories and Sunak still failing to turn things around. In fact, things are clearly getting worse as their voters sit on their hands or vote for Richard Tice's private company masquerading as a party called Reform UK, a.k.a. the Rupert Murdoch party, since all of the leaders seem to work for him on talk TV. Anyway, so this is the picture reflected in this one. But what about the other by-election? Well, this was the one we thought would never come, wouldn't it? Mid-Bedfordshire, will Nadine Dorries ever formally resign or will she just keep collecting the pay packet despite not turning up to work and leaving the people of that constituency without representation for over a year? Hers was, to my mind, a deliberate act of sabotage on Sunak, both in the name of her devoted dear Boris, who she still staunchly defended, of course, and the fact her entry into the House of Lords got denied to her, and she stamped her tiny feet over that, stormed off and had a sulk. Well, finally she acted her age and went, trigger, triggering the by-election, finally. The Tories put up the fabulously named Festus Akimbusuye, the first black police and crime commissioner in the UK, son of Nigerian refugees and by all accounts, likeable by Tory standards, though his use of Green Party colours and his electioneering, as so many Tories seem to have adopted lately, did wind me up a little bit. He was up against Alistair Strathern, a London councillor, a parachuted in Starmerite, though originally from the area. But with such a high-profile, awful MP as Nadine Dorries, you rightly might have thought the Tories could have been in deep trouble here. But here's the thing. Dorries had a majority of nearly 25,000. Massive majority. So that's quite the mountain for Labour to climb. Of course, they did. Again, the media conversation is all about the swing. The Tories down over 28%, Labour's vote up 12.4%, and the Lib Dems up 10.5%, so the Tory collapse very much got split between the other two main parties, both of whom were going around claiming they were the only ones who could win, that they were the tactical vote. And such is the folly of tactical voting, because this could have let the Tories retain. And they very nearly did, actually, because although Labour won and their vote share did increase, their majority it's a very modest 1,192. Skin of their teeth stuff, especially when they didn't pick up all of that Tory vote as the vote share figures imply. Because again, this is a misleading measure. Last night, Alistair Strathern won 13,872 votes, which was 156 votes fewer than Labour got in 2019 and 4,000 votes fewer than Labour got in 2017. So let's not pretend they won any Tory votes. They didn't. They even apparently lost Labour ones, albeit only a handful, academic numbers. The Lib Dems vote this time only went up by around a thousand votes, just for context. So again, what was the turnout here? 44.1% is not bad by normal by-election standards. However, turnout in mid-beds is usually in the 70%, quite high compared to national averages. So 44% turnout it's low for them, you would think. It works out as some 24,000 voters not bothering to turn out. And the Tory vote, funnily enough, was down some 26,000. So again, it's a story that the vast majority of Tory voters just stayed at home. Some obviously voted elsewhere, smaller parties, that kind of thing. This is what Starmer's success is built on in these recent by-elections. This is what his success is built on completely. It's built on sand. 
Never has there been a political leader more lucky and less deserving of becoming Prime Minister than Starmer, and he would appear to be cruising there right now. The only winner is apathy. Now, one caveat I'd say on this is that losing the odd by-election isn't going to change a government. So protesting by not turning out, not voting, as we've seen here, is something a lot of people will feel comfortable doing to send a message to their party that they aren't happy. Warning shots, bloody noses and all the other analogies you can think of. Come a general election, though, will they be as comfortable to sit things out? I don't know. Turnout is always higher at a general election. I don't think it'll be quite as comfy for Starmer as things appear to be right now. I can't see Starmer doing anything to boost his chances. Every time he opens his mouth, it just puts more people off him. Alternatively, Sunak is toast. He can't turn things around. He failed to get any boost off the back of Tory party conference. He's been a public embarrassment fawning over the occupier Netanyahu out in Israel. And the timing of, Israeli, of his Israeli trip smacks of running away from what he knew would be bad results for his party. He's acted increasingly in power as someone seeking to enrich himself, has given carte blanche to hard right culture wars, which appall more and more people, including Tories. He's done nothing right. The Tories are going to lose the next election and lose it horribly with him in charge. A man nobody chose, not even Tory members, and they are staying at home over it. I'm reminded that the Tory party only got back into power back in 2010 with somebody coming off the back benches in David Cameron. I think if they're to stand a chance of giving Starmer a run for his money, we'll have to see a repeat and get rid of all those tarnished by the last 13 years of Tory rule. Or directly tarnished, I should say. But there's no talent there. No talent whatsoever within the Tory party. They're all self-serving grubs. So whether Sunak goes or not, I'm not sure it's going to make any difference with a year in reality at best to go before another general election. If the Tories do want to do something about Sunak, though, his one year of grace where he can't be challenged over his leadership is over in five days' time. So will we see some movement then? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Either way, both of these by-elections were the result of Tory voters staying at home and nothing more. And Sarah Edwards and Alistair Strathern have been given mandates to represent these constituencies despite only actually having one 16% and 16.5% of their constituencies' votes, respectively. Of course, Keir Starmer called these results a game-changer, but then he's a liar. And he's lying to himself, if he really believes that. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do leave a comment and have your say on all of this and join in the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation, which again shows apathy as the real winner each time, as we saw a similar picture in the other recent by-election up in Scotland, Brother Glenn and Hamilton. It's very much a trend, and with more by-elections likely in the non too distant future, it's a picture that is likely to keep on being replicated. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so last night Israel abandoned any pretense that it is only striking at military targets when two of the world's most ancient and religious buildings just got hit by airstrikes. The 1,600-year-old Church of St. Porphyrios, a Greek Orthodox church, and the third oldest Christian building on the planet was hit. And then later so was the Great Mosque of Gaza, itself 1,400 years old, with all the associated casualties that that brought with it. But what kind of military targets are these? Religious sites of Christians and Muslims seemingly deliberately targeted and we're supposed to believe that religion bears no part in this that this is israel presenting its right to defend itself as the west keeps telling us after those absolutely condemnable hamas attacks everything israel does and everything israel gets criticized for always comes back to religion and that by criticizing the jewish state that we are being anti-semitic they play that card all the time yet they can allegedly attack the places of worship of other religions themselves as part of their war in hamas how does that make sense and why can we not call them out on that? This isn't Judaism at fault either, I will be clear. There are Jewish people the world over holding Israel in absolute contempt right now. This is very much a Zionist issue. That these attacks upon the places of worship of other religions are Zionist attacks happening in Palestine as a further sign of ethno-religious cleansing. And it gives the impression that this is no longer just about the getting of Hamas. That this is no longer just the latest targeting of Arabs as part of the 75 year long Israeli occupation, but they won't actually be satisfied until the entire history of Palestine is erased. Right, so Israel has struck civilian targets again, it would seem, this time a Greek Orthodox Church and the Grand Mosque of Gaza itself. War crimes, by any measure, sheltering people amidst ongoing attacks by Israel, all done in the name of getting to Hamas. 
Well, what business have you got intentionally targeting a church then? So Porphyrius Church has stood since the 5th century and was giving shelter to some 385 Palestinians, both Christian and Muslim, when an airstrike struck two halls of the church, killing some 18 people. Though with more trapped, that number may well yet rise. It's the figure at time of writing. Israel's excuse is that they were targeting a military command centre and the church was collateral damage. One man who was sheltering there said, We were sheltering at the St. Porphyrius Orthodox Church. 385 Christians were sheltering at the church. We refused to be forcibly displaced to Sinai. They told us to evacuate to South Gaza. We said, we're not leaving. We want to die here. So they went ahead and killed us here. They dropped the airstrike directly onto the church, the building with 385 people inside. A two-story building was flattened. There is another church as well, housing 500 people. Watch them bomb it too. Well, I sincerely hope we don't see another church bombed, but when you consider that the Al-Ali Baptist Church is also a Christian institution, it's not hard to see why the Christian population of Gaza, they make up some 1% of the population, might believe they are being deliberately targeted right now under the auspices of hunting Hamas on a religious basis. There are actually two other churches in Gaza City in the north of Gaza, the Gaza Baptist Church, which Israel hit in 2008, it has to be said, and the Holy Family Church, which is a Catholic church, who will bear watching out for in the news of Christians in Gaza are right in their feelings that their places of worship are being targeted deliberately by Israel. Not content with having hit a church, though, Israel subsequently also levelled the Great Mosque of Gaza. It's gone. The third largest and third oldest mosque in Palestine, and in this instance, it has been reported by Turkish-based Anadolu Agency, the media outlet who first debunked the beheaded baby story that was being put out by pro-Israeli news, that an Israeli aircraft targeted the mosque specifically and completely destroyed it. Notably, and in line with the feelings of Christian Gazans and their churches, this isn't the first mosque to be destroyed during this conflict. It's actually the fifth. Now, this attack is not exactly bringing with it a lot of details right now. I've no idea on casualties, for example. Though you figured there would be some, otherwise why would Israel target it? If Hamas are hiding out there, there would be people in there, wouldn't there? That would be giving them reason enough to target it, in their minds anyway. But so far, there's no detail on casualties, as we've had regarding St. Porphyrios. So why else would it be it? I'm still of the opinion there's an intended land grab here, levelling the north of Gaza under the guise of eliminating Hamas, whilst driving Palestinian people south does seem to me an opportunity to take more land off them for Israeli settlers afterwards. But the targeting of religious buildings... I looked at these stories this morning, and I'm scratching my head a bit, and thinking things I don't want to be thinking, like, is this deliberate targeting of other religions now? Obviously we've seen the persecution, and we can draw from what we read and they're told that this is about a Jewish state versus an Arab one. But is there more to it than that? Are the Zionists so obsessed with their notion of a Jewish state that there is no room for other religions now? We're in the Middle East here. Israel, Palestine, all the places that mean so much to not just Judaism but to Islam and to Christianity too. Three of the world's great religions, all with ties to this land, now being fought over so horribly. But is it now a situation where the presence of two of those religions is something not to be tolerated any longer? Why else target religious buildings? We've had an excuse from Israel over the church strike, but not the mosque. Why hit it? I thought some more about this situation, and I thought, well, maybe it's not necessarily the religious side of it, or not exclusively so. That may still be part of the story. But could it be more about this whole Jewish state Zionist obsession and the knowledge that before they were given Palestinian land to call their own in 1948, they were completely stateless. Of course, most Jewish people around the world have integrated into all other societies post-war, become part of the diaspora, and very welcome they are as well. But for Zionists, this was never going to be enough. They needed a homeland, and nothing less will do, and of course they got it. They wanted more, and so we have this 75-year history of occupation and subjugation of Palestinians, the apartheid that we've come to witness. But is it all built on a sense of paranoia? The Zionists even now, as they have seemingly all the power in the region and the servile acquiescence of other countries like the US and the UK in their blind loyalty and their arms and their funding, but are they still so insecure that with other religions present, with symbols of those religions, of the people who follow those religions, that they can't be satisfied that what they have won't be taken away from them until such people who they perceive to threaten them are gone 
along with all sign of their existence. I'd never before seen thousand-year-old monuments and culture destroyed before ISIS were doing so in the aftermath of the Iraq war. That genuinely shocked me that such historically important artifacts and carvings and temples were of zero value to them and they just desecrated and destroyed them. But what Israel are doing in targeting such globally recognized and respected institutions, buildings that have survived for so many hundreds of years, if they are being deliberately targeted, how is that desecration any different? This is significant ancient cultural heritage getting wiped off the face of the earth, along with the people who worship and spend time in these places, making this more than an apparent genocide that looks to be the, the way things are moving in Palestine and in the Gaza Strip right now. They're actually managing to make it even worse than that. What are your thoughts on this? Are Israel deliberately targeting places of worship that aren't Jewish? Because I've not actually heard of any Palestinian synagogues being hit as yet, and there are some, though I'm happy to be corrected on that if, if you know different. Let me know in the comments below. Do be part of the conversation on this if you have something to say on this matter as well. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Israel have, it would seem, managed to implicate themselves in the attack on the Al-Ali Baptist Hospital, despite going above and beyond to try and say otherwise. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.